Hi, I'm Oliver, and this is Deep Cuts, a channel dedicated to music for lovers of music. First off, thanks to all of you who have donated to my coffee page over the past week. Those donations, I've already put a couple of orders in for some books, for some upcoming guides that I'm going to be doing, you know, Sonic Youth, uh, Kate Bush, loads and loads of people. Um, so thank you so much to those people who have done that. And to those people who partook in their first listening party on the Deep Cuts Discord last week, thank you so much for joining us. I think you did have quite a lot of fun. It seemed like everybody was enjoying it, so thank you for coming along. Still loads of space for people to come and join our listening parties every Monday, every Thursday at 9pm BST. We have so much fun, come get involved. I thought that given the music site Pitchfork just awarded Fiona Apple's new record Fetch the Bolt Cutters a perfect 10, their first perfect 10 since Kanye West's My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy in 2010, it would be a good time to talk about the impact that these kind of large publications can have on people's approach to music for the first time. You know, what do these reviews do to your your experience of listening to a record. I guess some of my discomfort with this topic comes from the fact that I don't like reviewing records numerically. So when I used to do my album roundups, monthly roundups, for those of you that have been watching the channel for that long, I didn't do that and I tried to use a word to explain what I felt about the record because I felt that, you know, say for instance I have three or four nines in a year, then I'm in some ways encouraging you to compare those nines and try and you know, work out what features gave them that numerical quality, that numerical marker in the first place and things start to get a bit confusing and you're starting to compare pieces of art that could be wildly different in terms of their approach, their methods, their style, their emotive qualities, etc. It's generally incredibly reductive to compare pieces of art in that way and I'm sure most of you will agree with that. And yet in certain forums I've already seen people comparing Fetch the Bolt Cutters to other Pitchfork perfect scores over the years. So my Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, uh, Radiohead's Kid A, Wilco's Yankee Hotel Foxtrot. You know, people are doing it, and this album's only been out for like three days. I did a video way back on numerical ratings, which I'll link in the description. But you know, this idea you know, of Pitchfork only giving out a handful of tens over the years, are they saying that these are the only records that can be quote unquote perfect? Uh, and no other record within these time frames have managed to reach the lofty peaks of quality. And clearly it's making some people want to compare the two things, compare Kanye West's smash ego epic with Fiona's new record, which is a very deep piece of work. There's a lot of layers to it. And I can't believe that anybody after three or four listens of Fetch the Bolt Cutters is already proclaiming it to be one of the best records of all time, just because uh, and personally it's taking me a long time to uncover the layers and, and decide how I feel about it as a record. As a side note, I do think it's a very impressive piece of work and I'm liking it more and more as I listen to it. But what does that elusive, perfect score do to our thoughts behind a record and our approach to a record in the first place? And this isn't an attack on Pitchfork per se. I just think it's interesting to think about how the dynamic of conversation can be changed when an when a influential critical voice makes such a grandstanding statement about a record and how that can overshadow the, the approach to a record and, and overshadow the depth of a record. You know, I think the same could be said for if a, a number of aggregate sites and newspaper reviewers and that kind of thing all give one record that coveted album of the year accolade. I think it can have the same effect. The perfect record, I mean straight up the word perfect doesn't mean anything when it comes to art because art is subjective, we all know that, and the notion that any piece of art could be classed as perfect doesn't actually make any sense. But subjectivity versus objectivity isn't really the topic I'm interested in in this video. I'm more interested in what it's like as a music fan or even a casual observer of music to go and start listening to this record for the first time if it has been classed as perfect or objectively fantastic. I know I often feel a sense of trepidation if I'm about to listen to a record that's been as lauded as that, as if I'm about to listen to something so monumental I must make it an event listen. Usually if it's from an artist you already love then you come with your own set of expectations for a record and it's not quite the same if it gets really highly praised I don't think, but if it's an artist you're not as familiar with and it gets all this praise heaped on it, I mean I certainly find myself inevitably thinking wow you know this, this is, this is going to be great you know I'm very excited to listen to this and I'm going to have lofty expectations of the quality of it before I listen to the first couple of seconds. And what if I don't like it? If I don't like it, 
I must be wrong. You know, this pressure of liking a record that's been touted as life-affirming, essential, unmissable, can often completely derail the subjective conversations that are vital for art to thrive in the first place. If all of a sudden the critical consensus propels an album into the flaming center of music fandom, you're gonna feel like you need to listen to it. Hell, you might even feel guilty until you've actually taken some time to listen to it. And if you don't like it, then well, you must be wrong. You don't get it or you haven't given enough time to listen to it or worst of all, you're just being contrarian. I wonder how many of us can legitimately say we've never been swayed by critical consensus or, or you know, influential critics making a grandstanding statement about an artist. You know, how many of us have, have, have listened to something and forced ourselves through it only months later to realize we've never gone back to the record because we never liked it in the first place and we had problems with it that we were trying to ignore in order to see the quote unquote genius that this critic was saying that this album had. Music fandom can be a strange thing to be involved in, and I think undoubtedly now, a number of the conversations that will happen around Fetch the Bolt Cutters over the next few months are gonna be about that perfect score and whether you can see the genius in it or whether you are kind of trying to justify your opinion because you don't agree with what certain critics have said. And all the while that conversation is kind of taken away from the conversation about the music itself, which I realize I am perpetuating through this video, kind of, but I still think it's an interesting discussion to have. It becomes I agree or I disagree with this critical opinion, this critical consensus, which is again, reductive. But you know, I do think music criticism has a place and I've said that before on this channel, I'll continue to say it, not least because I kind of fall under that music criticism banner, please don't stop watching. And I think it's important that we have critical voices out there because if we don't, then it's very hard for us to wade through the thousands of artists releasing records every single week. You know, how are we supposed to separate things and listen to things without, you know, uh, editorials talking about certain records or um, releases of the week and all those kind of things. So it's kind of a necessary thing as part of being a fan of music. But there's no doubt that with such high praise handed down to something before most of us have even had a chance to click play, there is gonna be a level of influence there, even if it's subconscious, and your own listening experience, first listening experience, may ultimately be affected by it. There's also another side to music discourse when these big albums make such a huge critical splash, the inevitable anti-bandwagon. This is the other reason I get frustrated with these big grandstanding reviews, and again, it's not the reviewer's fault or really the publication's fault, but there will be, and I don't know how long it will be after Fetch the Bolt Cutters come out, there will be an anti-bandwagon of people who love to obnoxiously tell people why they don't like the record, why they think the critical consensus is wrong. These are the true contrarians, the free thinkers, the ones who aren't influenced by critical opinions or critical reviews, but they that's fine if you're not swayed by critical reviews, not a problem, you know, well done to you, congratulations. But if you're wearing it on your sleeve like an obnoxious prick, which I see a lot of people do online, that's a problem. It's toxic and it doesn't do anything for the conversation around the music. Also, by being so overt about disagreeing with the critical consensus or review, you're just giving that a general idea about that record more light in the first place. So it's not really working. You're not really ignoring the idea, are you? You're just you're feeding off of it in a like a contrarian, irritating way. And again, I don't think any of this is really the reviewer's fault because they just wanted to spotlight some, some music that they really like. But it's worth thinking about how these critical darlings often inspire conversation that becomes a bit of a partisan standoff where people are fighting tooth and nail to either agree or disagree with this massive grandstanding consensus. And all of this can smother a piece of creative work like Fetch the Bolt Cutters, which is produced and written in a way that I think as a listener, you need to let it unfurl. You need to take your time with it because it's it's like it has no historical reference. It, it feels like it, it, it exists in its own space and therefore it's gonna take people some time to get used to it and decide how they feel about it. Uh, and you know, it's lyrically, it's very deep and quite difficult at times and therefore you need to take time with it. But if you're, if you're going in to listen to it for the first time, going, this is a masterpiece, this is a masterpiece, this is a masterpiece, completely blinkered, that actually, I think, can massively affect the way that you listen to this record and, and, and let it open up to you. I would argue a big perfect rating like this can really affect the way you listen to a piece of music, but I want to know what you guys think about it. What are your experiences with listening to a record touted as the second coming? You know, please let me know in the comments section if you disagree with the things that I've said in this video. Let me know also if you agree, because it's nice to have some people on my side. And what about this recent Fiona Apple record? Do you think that you approached it in a different way because of that perfect score and it ended up higher in your estimation because you're trying to search for that 
perfection that somebody else has seen in it or is actually do you find that these critical opinions don't really uh, don't really touch your psyche when you go and go and listen to a record do you believe that, that it just completely washes over you or you know because it's pitchfork and many people dislike pitchfork does it get your hackles up anyway that they've given a perfect score and, and to this and to nothing else for the past 10 years or do you just simply not care keen to know your thoughts anyway so let me know in the comment section below and we'll get a little bit of a chat going about it it's been a while since i've done one of those kind of discussion videos tonight we're going to be doing Fiona Apple's Fetch the Bolt Cutters listening party on the Deep Cuts Discord and on Thursday I just decided I fancied listening to the Mars Volta's d Loud in the Comatorium. No particular reason, uh, I'm working on a live performance project actually with a couple of friends to do with Mars Volta so that's partly the reason but I just thought it'd be fun. So come and join us, thank you very much and I'll be back next week with Mars Davis Part 2. See you then. <laughs>